Thank you for joining us for this exciting Bible study podcast as Pastor Robert walks us chapter by chapter through the book of Jeremiah. Good evening, everybody joining us via Zoom, and Happy New Year. Welcome. Happy New Year. Um, And it's a very snowy night out tonight, so we're glad to have you in-house this way via Zoom. And we've got all kinds of friends who ventured out tonight as well, too, um, to be with us. Uh, The start of a new year in God's Word, that's exciting always, isn't it? And we're continuing with Jeremiah. So uh, join me uh, in prayer. Let's ask for God's blessing as we resume our study from our Christmas and New Year's break. And and as we look to a great, great uh, year of study uh, together with the Lord. Father, thank you for your never-ending blessing in Christ, the indescribable gift, Jesus, that you are to us as Savior and as Lord, as our brother, uh, as our Savior and Redeemer. How, How can we ever thank you? And even all eternity won't be long enough for the praise that we desire to give to you uh, for coming in such a servant way, coming uh, as born of a virgin, as a baby, and coming to redeem us from our sin. Well, that message, God, we never get tired of. And uh, we thank you for the cross and for the empty tomb. And Jesus, your powerful ruling on your throne, uh, even now tonight. Uh, Thank you for the safety you've granted us Uh, during this holy season and now to be together again in your house and to be here with your word open to us. Um, God, please send us your blessing at the start of this new year. And we ask for your presence to abide with us in a wonderful and powerful way, Lord. We we never want to be an inch away from you. We want to be connected um, by faith and have your spirit work mightily and powerfully in our minds and hearts. And you've been faithful to do that in the old year. We trust you for that in this new year. So as we turn our heart's attention to your precious word, the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, God, we're, we have ears that are open to hear you and our hearts that um, are welcoming uh, your speaking to us. So thank you for what you'll do in this study tonight and throughout uh, this whole new year, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, friends. Well, um, grab your outline on your tables. Uh, there are extra copies on the empty tables here if, if there weren't enough at your table. We are starting uh, again. We're resuming where we left off, Jeremiah chapter 13 tonight. Um, just a couple notes at the top of your outline. Uh, Make sure you're on the side that says subsequent pictures of judgment, Jeremiah 13. Starting tonight, we will uh, be doing uh, two chapters per week in order to finish uh, the book by the end of this school year, by May 25th. So we'll be doing two chapters a week. Yes, we have to do double the amount of material. And uh, thus, we'll have to change our format a little bit. So you'll even notice that the outline you have looks a little different than it did last year. Um, We're also going to, uh, we'll change the way we read the text. We're still going to read it all, uh, but we're going to break it up into parts. And so we'll read a certain amount of verses and then do the outline that is specific to those verses. Then we read the next set of verses and then do a little study and questions. So that'll be different. Because my concern is if we read two chapters straight, we're going to kind of forget everything that's at the end. (laughs) And so we're going to try this, and I appreciate your feedback. You can email me, uh, talk to me, too, if you say it's working or I've got this idea. I'm always happy to hear from you that way. So uh, we're going to read just individual sections at a time and then do the study appropriate to those verses. Um, So, yes, there will be a change in how much detail... Uh, we dive into in a given text, again, because we're doubling the amount of material. Um, so typically we call this a little bit more survey, survey where, you know, we, we're going to look at every verse, but we just won't have the time to dig into every verse the way we might have used to done. There will still be emphasis on application. What does this book say to us today? And I hope our questions tonight are are uh, important for us. Okay. So you'll notice there is no opening uh, section on your outline that says, look for good news markers. 
we'll do that just as we go through the text or the special attention verses. Again, we'll do that as we go through the text. And there won't be the group questions where I give you 10 minutes at your table to kind of get your feet wet. You know, we just can't take the time, unfortunately, to do that. So those elements at the beginning of of your outline are are not there tonight, uh, just so that (laughs) we can approach this different. Okay, so we'll do the best we can and still trust God for um, his speaking to us tonight. So uh, with that, uh, tonight, yeah, I gave the title of chapter 13, Subsequent Pictures of Judgment. It's not a real memorable title. Um, As we know, you know, the prophecy of Jeremiah has a lot of judgment messages. um, So that's a pretty generic one there. But we're starting in chapter 13, then, with an object lesson on your outline, Roman numeral one, uh, looking at the linen garment So chapter 13, we're going to start then by just reading verses 1 through 7, uh, letter A on your outline, the act. We're going to look at this object lesson, the act. We'll read just verses 1 through 7, and then we'll go through uh, that part of the outline. And I think we have a volunteer already ready to read. Go ahead. Says the Lord to me, go and buy a linen loincloth and put it around your waist, and do not dip it in water. So I bought a loincloth according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the loincloth that I have, that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a cleft in the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. And after many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates and take from there the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. So then I went to the Euphrates and dug and took the loincloth from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Thank you. Okay, so that's our first section. So please, if you'll glance at your outline. Um, at this point, we're going to look first at the object of this object lesson. The NIV uses the term linen belt. The King James, if you're using it tonight, uses the term girdle. The ESV uses the term loincloth, so that uh, is helpful there. And the New American uses the term undergarment. This Hebrew word is kind of used in both ways as a belt or as you might say, you know, a holy pair of BVDs um, or boxers. It's used in both ways um, in scripture. The Hebrew simply means to gird or to clothe and then the the specificness of it. Now, it's interesting. This word is not used a lot. You'd understand this kind of a garment in scripture. I mean, it. The belt part of it, you say there's nothing wrong with that, but if it's an undergarment, it's not going to be spoken of a lot in Holy Scripture. Twelve times it appears in this text, eight of the twelve times the word loincloth or undergarment is used in this text. So there's only four other scriptures outside of this one that actually use this word or term. In Second Kings chapter 1 on your outline, Elijah uh, the prophet wore a linen, a, a belt, yeah, the same, or loin cloth, depending upon your translation. And Elijah's the picture of which prophet in the New Testament who wore the same thing and is described wearing the same thing? John the Baptist. So you have that uh, text uh, in your outline as well, too. In Isaiah 11, verse 5, it's interesting that Christ, in the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 11, he wears a belt of righteousness. Now, that picture is kind of picked up then in Ephesians chapter 6, not in your outline, you know, for the armor pieces for a believer. You know, so the picture of the belt or the undergarment, it is used in significant texts. In Exodus 28, in your outline, verse 42, it is not the same Hebrew word But most commentators and most people, you know, working with the ancient language, 
uh, look at Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Exodus 28, and the priest is to wear a specific linen undergarment or loincloth. Um, it's not the same word we have here, but the two seem to be uh, related and close together that way. So again, uh, loincloth or an undergarment. Now we've got an illustration of one tonight. So we're going to look at one, correct? Have you still got it or is it in the car? Is it in the car? No. Yeah, because this is really interesting. Now you can just stay right there because they'll see you where you're standing. So uh, Barry brought his from Thailand. And so d- describe it and tell us a little bit about it, Barry. It's kind of a utility garment. can be used for many things. Um, some, it's kind of a casual thing for at home after hours and or and where they might wear it like this, tucked in. And some some even change clothes underneath it. You know, it's their own little dressing room. Take, and also put this on and uh, take clothes off. Get take a bath with it on. Um, a dipper. And some there was. Uh, yeah, uh, some I've seen some Thai young men. Take it, and I, I don't know how they did it, but it's kind of looked kind of like a diaper. Oh, okay. And they they had it they had it all tied up and tied uh-huh. up on the corners. Go swimming. Oh, okay. And they're going going down. BVDs. The, yeah. There's your. Yeah, BVDs. Yeah. And um, I when I lived up country uh, in Thailand, a lot of times I went around just with it. Tied. Like this, and go, go, you know, going visiting, and sometimes um, sitting around visiting, and flies <laughs> <laughs> or mosquitoes. You know. So then it's a fan. Yeah. It's a yep. utility bird. You can tie the corners and put it on a like, stand right in your baby. I have no idea how yep. this relates to um, the, the, the text. Movie. Yeah, the text it's note. Sure. Right, and, and some some women would um, tie the corners together like this, and have it like this, and have a an infant here at their breast. Okay, and, yeah, and we kind of see those even today, don't we? Something like that today. Oh, okay. One All time, right. I rode my motorcycle down about a mile away or less to a, a and. A Chinese um, duck farmer. I wanted to buy some some duck eggs. I forgot to bring my shoulder bag, but I had this around my waist. And he said, "Well, just take that and pull and tie." Well, how do you do that? He said, "You tie the opposite corners together, and it makes a pouch. You just, just just put it, up, you know." So I had it. It was I had it around here, and and I had. Duck eggs, about a dozen or two in here. And I rode my motorcycle back and then up that road. Yeah, we're, we're glad you didn't hit a patch of stones. And, yeah. Scrambled eggs. Scr- scrambled eggs, yeah. So, you know, that kind of a garment is, is quite interesting here. Now, now let's get back to the text here and learn a couple of things. So look at number two, the commands. There, there, there are three sets of commands that God gives. So we just want to glance at verse one, pick out the commands that God gives to Jeremiah, because this is an object lesson. It's a, it's a working visual aid, right? So what are the commands? Verse one. Okay, buy one. Yep. Yep, around his waist and... And don't let it touch water. So, uh, I mean, however this linen garment, it would, you know, be damaged or such or collect mold if it got wet. Now, verse four is the second set of commands. And there is some time that obviously has elapsed since he bought it and tied it around him. So we have the commands in verse four to do what? Okay. So first he's supposed to go to a particular location called in your text. Okay, so some of you have Euphrates. Do any of the rest of you have something else? Perith. Yeah, and you're going to ask, what's the connection between Euphrates and P-E-R-A-T-H? And you go, there's no, there's no 
uh, you know, linguistic connection between the two. And he's supposed to hide this linen loincloth or belt in a crevice uh, in, a, in a rock in Perith. And then we get to the third set of commands in verse 6. And notice there's a, a, a time lapse that is significant enough that verse 6 says many days later, right? A significant amount of time later. Then what's the command there? Go back to where you hid it and dig it up and, and, and take it again. Now, so we just quickly considered the, the location of where he is directed to go. In verse 4 and 6, you either have the word Euphrates for the river, and that would have been about a 350-mile one-way walk. So 700 miles round trip, and he did it how many times? Twice. He made this trip twice. I mean, that was a huge thing. Now, other folks, if you have a footnote in your Bibles, some commentators consider the town para, P-A-R-A-H. And I'm going, well, that's not really close to Perath, which is what the Hebrew says. Um, And para was a small town in Benjamin, which is the location of where Jeremiah is living. So it might have been, you know, a mile or two away for him to go to Para, and the town Para had an artesian well. And so he hid the belt or loincloth in a crevice in the rock, uh, and that's the case. So th- those are the two things, and that's quite extreme, right? A, a short walk across town or a long-distance hike to a location associated, of course, with what the Jews are going to be doing there within a, a, a couple of decades from this text. They're going to be in Babylon, which is on the Euphrates River. Comment or question? Yeah. Wasn't he ministering in Jerusalem? Though? He's always going to the temple to proclaim stuff. And he was. The king hit him in the court, you know, or they dropped him in the well. Yeah, but we're not there yet. No, and in this text, we're, we have no indication that we're in Jerusalem. Um, we've, we've spoken of Jerusalem, um, but yeah, you have to go back to last year's notes. Sorry. <laughs> last year's notes. Yeah. Yeah. Comment or question? Uh, um, maybe question too. Sure. Is it, is it possible that the sash is symbolic of righteousness? And if you, you buy the righteousness, you buy it from God and you wear it where it's noticeable and seen. But if you take it and hide it, it doesn't do any good. It's going to deteriorate. Mm-hmm. So my, my thought was that it's a possibility he's talking about righteousness here. It, it could be. I, I'm just always a little cautious because then the next person will say it symbolizes justice or truth. The text itself does not teach uh, a spiritual attachment to the item. So I, I'm always careful about giving a symbolic or a spirit, spiritualizing a text. Uh, it could very well be true. So to everybody, it could very well be true. Um, but I'm always trying to make sure I stick close enough to the text in what it says and what it doesn't say on that. So I appreciate that comment on that one. So now we're going to turn to the interpretation because God himself. Th- so this is why I'm going to stick to the interpretation. God gave the interpretation of what Jeremiah and the people were supposed to get out of it. So um, let's continue reading then with verses 8 through 11. So we're at letter B, the interpretation. We'll read 8 through 11 and then look at that part of the outline. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, even so I will, I will spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubborn, stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. Verse 11, too. Please. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I have made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. Mm. And that, that's a sad conclusion to that. So just three comments, and then perhaps that spurs on some discussion for us. Verses 9, 10, and 11 
it is interesting. If you look at the information close enough, it's, it's a, it's a flip flop of the three trips, uh, or the three commands, the three sets of commands that were made in the opening verses one through seven. Now we have, uh, God giving us the meaning of what we're supposed to get out of, uh, this object lesson. I mean, teachers love object lessons, don't they? I mean, kids, some kids learn best by seeing something, not by hearing something. And uh, scripture gives us these object lessons, which are, are, are kind of neat too. Oh, and I missed that point right underneath Roman number one on your outline. I just skipped over that. But just to remind our Ezekiel friends from, I don't know how many years ago, uh, Ezekiel had all kinds of object lessons like this too. Um, and I just mentioned Ezekiel four, he was supposed to take a lump of clay and carve the city of Jerusalem out of it. And then he was supposed to build siege works and siege ramps against the city. If you remember that an object lesson of a prophetic thing that the city would be sieged. And then remember Jeremiah had to lay on his left side and right side, 390 days on one and you know, a shorter period of time on the other and lay the sins of the people on his left and right side. So, you know, visual aids and poor guy probably had a hip displacement after that, you know, laying on the side there, but yeah, that comment I missed, but scripture has these object lessons, visual aids. And now we look at three things. So letter B, the interpretation, God tells us what we're supposed to understand from this. So number one, first of all, this ruined Girdle, verse 9, this ruined girdle, because it was in the cleft or in the crevice of the rock, then God tells, so see, verse 7 talked about the ruined part, and verse 9 is its, is its mirror image, and, and there's something about God's people that is just completely unpleasant, and it's called the pride of Judah, well, pr- pride is a sin that makes us as unpleasant, you know, today before God and before each other um, as it would for the people uh, who were, you know, trying to live self-sufficient without God. So the ruined girdle is a picture of the pride of his people, which he will ruin. He, he will bring judgment uh, upon them. Right. So number two, a useless uh, distant people, a useless people. The term useless is picked up then as well about the girl. And notice in verse 10, I just think it's interesting that these wicked people, there's this list of their sins, right? They won't obey or listen. They follow their own hearts. They're self-sufficient. They go after other gods. They serve and worship. There's this picture of distance from God, spiritually speaking, And that's where, I don't know, I tend to think that the journey was the 700-mile round trip to Babylon, Uh, you know, because the distance itself, it's like, what did you do? Where'd you go, Jeremiah? Why'd you make that trip a second time? It it was the way that conversations might have gone. And the people are spiritually distant, verse 10 tells us, and thus they're useless to God. They're useless to God because of their own sin. Um. And then we see this issue of the belt or the garment. So either way, whichever way you understand it, as a belt or as a garment, number three in verse 11, this picture, this is really striking to me. I hope you have some discussion about it because God picks up on just the part that it's bound. A belt is close to your waist. A garment is close to your waist. He's picking up on that part of it and interpreting it it, in a way that should be for the blessing and benefit of his people. He says, I bound you to myself. I, and that's a powerful spiritual picture, right? God bound. And no, notice who he bound, verse 11. Who? Oh, folks, this is interesting because where is the house of Israel at this time in history? They're gone. They've been gone in the Assyrian captivity since 722 BC, 721. And we're at, you know, maybe, you know, 610, you know, 615, 620. They've been gone for 100 years. And God is still speaking of both parts, you know, the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes of Israel. But the the prophecy of Jeremiah primarily is to the the last two tribes, Judah, Judah and Benjamin. 
But now this is close. So this is a rarity. This happens in this prophetic indications to remind us God still sees and knows where his people are. <laughs> um, so verse 11, and he bound them to me. He took them as his own people. Now, d- d- you know, don't be mistaken by that either. This wasn't an, an automatic um, get out of jail and go to heaven free card, right? He selects a nation where he can reveal himself and teach his will and his law. But we find at the end, end of the verse, uh, as was read, that they have no interest. They're not listening, which is the Hebrew word for obedience, the end of verse 11. They're not, they don't care that God picked them out of all the peoples on earth that God could pick to reveal himself. They don't care. Um, and, and so the bound, the picture of the garment is teaching God graciously pick the Jewish people to be close to him. And, and they've just disregarded that, that closeness. Okay. Um, so I, I pose a, a question for discussion out loud. Now, if any of these are helpful, how close am I to God? I'm picking up on the picture of being bound to right? the garment that's close to you. Every one of us tonight is wearing some garments because of the snow that protects our skin, right? The closeness of that. How close am I to God? How does pride, my pride, distance me from God? What can I do to close the gap in this new year? How about some discussion that might help us apply this section? No discussion. Well, there's a new year one for you. I better pick better questions next time. Or I've got to get the Zoom people. You got to send chat because nobody's talking in this class, gang. Sorry. Um, Yeah, please. He, he's that close that God is just a thought away. I, that's a beautiful picture, right? God's closeness, right? Uh, all right, let's pick it at this way. What are you doing this year in your personal reading and study of scripture? How about that? Would that help prime the pump a little bit? What are you doing? Because, of course, you know, some basic disciplines will show your closeness to God or your lack thereof. Anybody? Here's Here's one. Yeah. Speaking and talking to people, so I'm going to continue to hide in my basement this year. All right. And I can't be mean to anyone. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then maybe by next year I'll be ready. Okay. So does that mean you're reading twice or three times as much scripture because you were avoiding people? Yep. Does okay. There's kind of the closeness picture, right? Seven hours a day. Is beautiful. Hey, cool. Oh, that is beautiful. Yeah. Why not immerse yourself a whole day in the in the meeting with God? Right. Anybody else? Do you have a new uh, um, exercise of, of, of spiritual interest that might encourage someone else? Are you doing anything new in your Bible reading or study? That I'm reading the John MacArthur study Bible that should be chronological. Chronological study Bible? I, I never, I've tried it several times and didn't stick with it because I don't like stopping it oh. and getting into some a chapter. But I'm, I'm going to do it. Okay. Yeah, the, that, that is of, of some interest to me. It, even as we look at the Old Testament, which, you know, you know the books are not chronological at all. I've often thought, boy, I wonder if, if teaching through the Old Testament chronologically would really help people get the history. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad you're doing that. How about here? Uh, I've been reading through John Piper's commentary John Piper's commentary on the book, The Gospel of John. Okay, great. And your your first takes of it. Okay, it's good. All right. Good, good recommendation then. So finding a study book on a particular biblical book and using that, of course, for spiritual discipline, that's a great, a great thing to do, right? Because it takes you further beyond your own reading and your own processing. I, I like to think of my relationship with faith. Uh, if, if I don't take time to woo her, okay, then we drift apart. But if I make a continual effort to woo her, then then we'll be closer together. And the same thing with God. I, I have to make the effort to spend time with Him Good. to get close to. Him. Good. Yes, make the effort, folks. It's it's a good time for us to set some new patterns and carve out the time in your day. Uh, when it's, you know, your prayer closet time and your, your Bible uh, in hand time when you're, you know, sitting with the Lord, uh, just make sure that's, that's private and protected time, right? You and God uh, for your closeness in the new year. Okay. Let's go to uh, Roman two, please. Uh, now we look at somewhat of, of a parable. 
somewhat of a parable, and we're very familiar with that from the New Testament, about the wine jar. Some of you might have the translation wine skin, right? Do some of you have wine skin starting in verse 12? And you might, uh, and we'll talk about that object as well, too. So now we're reading verses 12 through 14, please. Do we have a volunteer for that? Thank you. You will speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jar shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do, do we not indeed know that every jar will be filled with wine? Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will fill with drunkenness all the inhabitants of this land, the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of the land. Is that oh, one more? And I will dash them one against another, fathers and sons together, declares the Lord. I will not pity or spare or have compassion that I should not destroy them. Okay. So we started with this object lesson of a ruined and destroyed garment being a picture of God's people that will be ruined and destroyed. It's a picture of judgment. Now we we have a second uh, picture lesson here. Uh, which is somewhat of a parable with this wine jar. Now, the object, the NIV is the only translation that used wine skin. Have you ever seen a, a, a wine skin, um, you know, made out of uh, animal uh, hide or leather? Um, ESV uses jar. King James uses bottle. And the NAS uses jug. So the other three translations incline themselves to something that uh, can be easily broken. And if you look at the primary verb of what God's going to do with this object in verse 14, that kind of suggests how the translation should be understood. What is God doing? The primary verb of verse 14. Yeah. So smash, does that incline itself to wine skin or to a, a jar bottle or jug? This is more likely a clay jar or a clay pot uh, because you don't smash a wineskin. Um, you, you smash something that's earthenware. So this is, this is where, you know, we let the text interpret the text. And it does help us in this case where the translation of a jar or a bottle or a jug would be much better. Now, the concept of, of uh, vessels that hold wine, that's both Old and New Testament. We find them all over. Uh, Jesus even, you know, spoke Matthew 9 in your um, verses in your outline about, you know, putting new wine in old wine skins. You got to be careful of that because as wine ferments, it expands. And if it's in an old wine skin that has no elasticity left, like a garment you've watched, uh, washed, you know, 50 times, the, the elastic is shot on it. Well, then it breaks the wine skin. And, you know, Jesus at the wedding at Cana told the servants to fill what? Yeah, jars. So picture that. Now, those were really big. They, they held a certain amount of gallons, right, in the wedding of Cana. But this kind of a word picture is very Jewish and very familiar as far as that goes. So then letter B, the proverb itself is interesting. Verse 12, this seems to be a proverb. We don't actually know the origin of it, that every wineskin should be filled with wine. It might be a Jewish proverb of the blessedness of God who provides the the grapes and the vineyard and the blessing. I mean, that would have been in the Pentateuch, um, you know, in the blessings for obedience for God. And there's a popular response that's given in verse 12 as well, too. Don't you think we know that? (laughs) See, so it was a well-known Jewish proverb. Yes, God brings blessing as his people are obedient. You know, their crops are abundant. Uh, Their children are abundant and their animals are abundant. They keep bearing and everybody knew that. So then let her see the contents. Now's where we're getting to the point of this visual picture. The content of the jar is not really wine. It's explained in verse 13 as being what? The content of the jar. What is it filled with? 
drunkenness. Here's where the spiritual point that God is bringing about. It, this is not just a normal jar of wine that you would have and you would use. And by the way, you know, there was not, you, you didn't have water purification tablets or those kinds of things. So, you know, mixing wine with your water was the way to keep you from getting tapeworms and all kinds of other parasites. So it was normal to drink wine on a regular you know, basis, but it didn't have the alcoholic content, you know, that you look at your bottles today of wine and they're anywhere from, you know, seven, eight, 17 percent. And then you look at liquor and it goes as high as what, 50 to 70 percent alcohol. That, that's not, you know, the Bible didn't work with those kinds of things. This cup, though, is filled with drunkenness. Now, this is the Old Testament picture then of judgment. Where, where God gives a cup of judgment to a person or a nation. Um, so he's going to fill it with drunkenness. And drunkenness is this lack of self-control and lack of, of sound reason and action, right? He is going to disorient his people. This is a judgment upon them that they become disoriented. And who is it going to affect? Verse 13. Who is this judgment of drunkenness going to affect? Yeah, every see the universal nature of it. Everyone in the land, from the kings to the spiritual leaders to the prophets to everybody in Jerusalem. Um, so what should bring gladness and joy, the uh, use of uh, wine in this Old Testament picture, it's going to be exchanged for, for a maddening disorientation. So what does it mean? Letter D, the interpretation and God using this verb, it is, it's a judgment picture again, right? He's going to smash his people one against another. I find this interesting because I don't know if there's a direct link, but you know, Jesus in the Gospels, you know, spoke, I, you know, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And I'm going to divide one family member, a father against a son or daughter. You know, this, this dismembering of social structure pictured here as a drunkenness that's a divine judgment upon a people who are disobedient and have forsaken God, where, where family units don't stay together anymore and people are at each other's kind of throats. Well, the word pictures of broken pottery, um, Jesus used that in Psalm 2 verse 9, right? He's going to break um, them in pieces. He uses it in Revelation uh, Jesus rules with an iron scepter and he breaks the pottery in pieces, a picture of his rule upon a world that is unruly. Um, and then the cup picture, uh, Jesus uses the picture of a, the cup, you know, that he receives from his father. What's in the cup that Jesus is drinking in the Garden of Gethsemane? You, you understand these are all word pictures, right? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane didn't have anything to drink. But he says, can you drink the cup that my father is giving me? He says to his disciples, right? What's in the cup? Judgment because of our sin, my sin. Jesus is drinking the judgment of God at Gethsemane and the cross for me, right? Um, so there is also a cup of blessing in this last Sunday. We celebrated it and we literally drank from the cup of blessing, the Lord's Supper is called a cup of blessing. <laughs> but um, in this context, of course, it's a judgment. So in this section, friends, just the brief question, what do we learn about God from this section? <clears throat> what do we learn about him from this section? What are we gleaning about God? He disciplines his people. Okay, he's discipline. Right. right. God doesn't trifle over this. I mean, sin is awful. It's wicked. And it brings the judgment of God. What else are you learning about him? Anything else from this section? And where do you see that? Yeah, in, in 12, though, in 12 through 14, of course, this is where section per section, you, you might have been drawing that from the belt. The belt, yes, and I certainly would agree, you know, with you on that, right? He binds his people to himself, but they don't want to be bound to him. They don't want it. 
So, yeah, the grace of God is there. In this particular section, though, the predominant verb, do you picture God with a giant mallet smashing people? That's what the text says. That's what the text says, friends. See? Smashing pottery. And there isn't going to be anything that survives. Well, what else is the judgment of God and and the destruction of hell? Besides God smashing people who have disobeyed him. See, I mean, even the New Testament, it's not going to use this word picture. But I don't know how else you'd understand the judgment of hell and and God separating people from him forever, except for a smashing. (laughs) It's harsh, isn't it? (coughs) It's very harsh in that. Okay, let's go to part three, as I look at my time ticking. Here's where we see, we could say, a last chance to repent. A last chance to repent. Here's where we're going to see a glimmer of grace. We're going to read, please, 15 through 17. 15 through 17 of our text, chapter 13. Hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Thank you. Yep. So first we see there is still uh, precious uh, glimmers of grace in the midst of a very hard judgment chapter, because there's the invitation, verse 15, the first imperative that you have in verse 15. It's the Hebrew word for obey. It's always interesting. Most of our translations just, uh, you know, literally put the word here, there, but here doesn't mean right in one ear. And out the other, in the Bible, here means always obey. God is inviting people to turn and repent, pay attention. And verse 16, isn't that precious? Give glory to God, right? Turn from self-centeredness, from your own selfishness, and look toward God. Give glory to him. Um, Otherwise... (laughs) you're going to find that God is not only a God of mercy and kindness, you're going to find out that he's a God who brings what? Verse 16 and 17. What else does God do? He not only saves, he also judges. I mean, here's your picture of darkness. And, you know, the New Testament picks this up where there's outer darkness as the judgment of God. Um, So God brings darkness, feet stumble, darkening hills. People hope for for light, and it turns to thick darkness. See the descriptive word phrases here, in gloom. How about the uh, the fog we had on Christmas Eve? Did, did you drive out? <laughs> oh, what about thick fog? You know, when you get that, uh, it just was gloomy, right? And verse 17 uses the key Hebrew word again to listen. If you don't listen, see, God's inviting you to listen, but if you don't, then Jeremiah has this, you know, weeping section that he weeps bitterly, you know, for his people, because the end of verse 17, they're going to be taken captive. They're, they're, God doesn't just, you know, walk away. There's going to be a judgment upon his people that will come. They'll be taken captive. So we have a picture of the exile here, right? Um, the, the discussion question, have you ever been in a position of hoping for light, verse 16, but only receiving darkness from God? How do you deal with this? Can anyone relate to to that um, verse, verse 16? You hoped for light, but you didn't get it. Does that anybody have a something they can relate to there? I thought God was going to do this, but he didn't. Anyone? All right. I would say two months ago we were praying daily for people that do survive our building that God would give us light and miracles and we did divine miracles we wanted. Yeah. So it was kind of dark. Yes. I I I think I'd relate to that, right? When our prayers were for deliverance and we had, you know, five funerals in a row. Yeah. 
And, and then we have to change our, uh, you know, worship of God and our adjustment of God because it, it did, the light just didn't come out of that, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Well in, well, in the sense of save, you know, some of us would say, yeah, the ones who God took home are far better off than us who are hanging here. So, you know, that aspect of, you know, having five funerals for those who are in Christ that was the answer of salvation because I'm going, boy, it sure beats shoveling snow tonight. Right. Yeah. But that was kind of silly anyway. So yes. And uh, we do have dear people who have recovered and have been answers to prayer, but sometimes, you know, we, we might just have that question mark on our head of what's God really doing in, in this situation. And we have to adjust maybe our own uh, understanding or expectations because his ways, Isaiah 55 are higher than our ways and his, his will obviously higher than our own too. So then Jeremiah ends with a lament there and he weeps uh, because of what's going to happen to the Lord's flock. Okay. Please comment. To, yeah. Or question. Speaking, every time there's an election, Somebody's disappointed. Oh, well, there, that's a good example, right? In an election, yeah. We hoped for light and we got darkness, right? And it causes us, again, to submit ourselves to God and to say, Lord, Every election, there's, somebody there's somebody who's disappointed. Yeah, that's, that's an example. There always is, right? Let's please uh, read now. We're in part four, a royal lament, verses 18 to 19. Let's read two verses, 18 to 19. Say to the king and the queen mother, say to the king and the queen mother, take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown has come down from your head. The cities of the Negev are shut up and with none to open them. All Judah is taken into exile, wholly taken into exile. Okay, a tiny little judgment, but now this one focuses on royalty. Um, we have uh, the king and the queen mother. Their names are not mentioned here. Did I leave those in your outline for you? Are they typed for you? King Jehoiachin. There's a Jehoiakim, which is his father, K-I-M, and then his son, Chin, C-H-I-N, at the end. And uh, he's 18 years old when he comes to the throne. How would you love an 18-year-old president? He rules for three months. He's evil. He's evil. And because he's 18 years old, he has his mother as the co-regent. His mother is named in scripture, Nehushta. Is her name in your outline? Nehushta. So she's she's ruling. (laughs) The the mother is ruling, uh, but he only rules for three months. And Jehoiachin and his mother Nehushta are taken in the second of three captivities of Babylon. So um, I gave you several texts, 2 Kings 22, 2 Kings 24, 2 Kings 29, Jeremiah 29, and so forth. Their names are mentioned in those texts uh, where, where this is prophesied that they will be taken down from their thrones, right? They're, they're going to be greatly humbled. And sure enough, Jehoiachin was in captivity his whole life long, and, uh, and then he came out of captivity and was treated well until the day of his death. But this prophecy did come true. Verse 19, where's the Negev? Where is it? Southern Israel. Israel. And perhaps we just pick up here that this issue of exile goes further than just Jerusalem. The Negev was the desert region the southern border of Israel. So this exile will affect the whole land is, is, our, is our point in verse 19. Okay, so it's going to affect everyone from the top people in government. It's going to affect all these rural shepherd kind of people way at the uh, southern desert of Israel. Okay, and we're going to read the concluding verses of chapter 13, please. 20 through 27, we're looking at the shame of Jerusalem. Lift up your eyes and see those who come from the north. Where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful flock? What will you say when they set as head? What will you say when they set as head over you, those whom you yourself have taught to be friends to you? 
Will not pangs take hold of you like those of a woman in labor? And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? It is for the greatness of your iniquity that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to doing evil, to do evil. I will scatter you like chaff driven by the wind from the desert. This is your lot, the portion I have measured out to you, declares the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in lies. I will lift up your skirts over your, I myself will lift up your skirts over your face and your shame will be seen. I have seen your abominations, your adulteries, your names, your lewd horns on the hills in the field. Woe to you, O Jerusalem. How long will it be before you are made clean? Mm -hmm. So a hard um, conclusion in this chapter. Just several notes. I'll ask you to glance at your text. We'll just pull out a couple of notes. This section seems to personify the city of Jerusalem as a woman that's being spoken to lift up your eyes and look. And uh, if you just look at verse 27, the second last line identifies Jerusalem, right? Woe to you. So this section seems to look at the city, the capital as a woman and is addressing her and the trouble, of course, that she's in. We see again in verse 20, a compass point from where the enemy will come. We've seen this perhaps a dozen times already. The compass point, merely north. We haven't found the city or the identification of Babylon yet, but it's coming. (laughs) But this is a a repeated thing. The enemy is coming from the north. And in verse 21, it makes no difference if Judah picks up on friends or allies, depending upon your translation. We read about that in other places in Kings and so forth. I mean, instead of going to God as their ally, they tried to pick people and other governments to help and support them. It won't work. The cause of the judgment coming upon them, there are many, verse 22, there are many iniquities, right? It's because of their sin. The consequence will be that they're treated uh, in verse 22 like a abused prostitute it's it's not a pretty picture verse 22 with the picture of having your skirt torn off of you and your body mistreated verse 22 this is this is a man who you know has got himself a prostitute and now he's mad at her and abuses her it's a horrific picture then of judgment, and it's repeated again in verse 26, the picture of pulling the skirt over your face. Um, you know, so it, it's, you know, the, the original sin is this love or lust between a man and his prostitute, you know, and then it turns to anger. The man is just pure, outright mad at the woman he's bought, and he abuses her. Um, and and this this is the description then of sin that God brings. Verse twenty three may be one of the the notable uh, verses, you know, talking about the inability of human nature to be changed by itself. You can't change a leopard spots. You cannot change your skin, even though certain people try to bleach it and turn the color of their own skin. You have not changed yourself see and so this becomes an old testament doctrine picture of of the depravity of mankind you you cannot fix your sin problem you need a savior this sets up that whole picture please i'm i'm never comfortable thinking of god as being sarcastic but is he being sarcastic here um yeah you know what that, that, that's a powerful question it is a great question and i I don't have enough skill in the Old Testament text to discern that, but many people do who have studied it, of course, much longer than me. Is is he? I I typically take this, though, as just a doctrinal statement of the inability of man to fix yourself. 
you just can't fix yourself. You cannot erase your sin, right? Uh, I've taken it always that way myself, but there, there is that type of language in the Old Testament uh, poetic texts. I, I certainly acknowledge it. I just don't have enough skill to know if this is one here. So I've typically taken this myself as just literal. Uh, you can't change the spots on a leopard and you can't change your sin problem. You can't change your sin nature. Right. And, and so in evangelistic uh, presentations, right. But can't I outweigh my bad things by the good things I do? That's what we typically say at this point, you know, can't man regenerate himself and become better. But, but it's, you know, Romans three is where I always go to then also from this text, Romans three, there is no one who does good. No, not one. And, and so I understand that text and this text, again, the inability, God is, is driving sinners to their end so that they will see him as the solution. You cannot fix yourself. Go to whatever counselor you want to. It won't fix you. You've got to go to God uh, to be able to change this. So that that kind of ends our, our section right there. And then we've got to save a little bit of time for our next chapter. And that's on the backside of your outline, please. The termination of all life. Now, friends, we're entering into a part of Jeremiah that has a lot of apocalyptic language. Some of it you're going to recognize because it's taken in the book of Revelation, uh, so this part of the section that all life is going to be destroyed. It's apocalyptic. The whole world, not just the, the, the Jewish people who have gone away from God. And so in this section, we see first this great drought um, that then God sent as a warning sign and as a judgment. And nobody survives through the drought. There's not water for man or beast. <laughs> and it shows this picture then of universal judgment, the termination of life. And then the chapter finishes with a triad, Roman numeral two, uh, of Jeremiah interceding with God on behalf of the people. And God answers Jeremiah each time with a no. I will not change my mind or my judgment on this. It's a hard chapter from that aspect. Jeremiah prays three times, God, please, there must be another way than you judging and destroying your people. And God answers three times in a row. Nope, I'm set on this. It's going to happen. So let's look at this section, please. We'll start by reading chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 6 in Roman number 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns and her gates languish. Her people lament on the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem goes up. Her nobles and her and their servants for water. Oh, her, no, her nobles send their servants for water. They come to the cisterns. They find no water. They return with their vessels empty. They are ashamed and confounded and cover their heads. Through, how far? Uh, through six. Because of the ground... Because of the ground that is dismayed, since there is no rain on the land, the farmers are ashamed. They cover their heads. Even the doe in the field forsakes her newborn fawn, because there is no grass. The wild donkeys stand on the bare heights. They pant for air like jackals. Their eyes fail, because there is no vegetation. That's great, thanks through that section, verse six. And I just put a, a discussion question because I, I just think this is one is always an interesting one. Are you more inclined to believe that weather happens by patterns or by divine decree and design? Where, where are you at with that? Because I know people are on both sides. Uh, I have no doubt that it's designed by God. Okay. Great. Any other comments on that issue? Weather. Okay. Okay. I agree with that. I think 
that was normal what the disciples ran into them. And Galilee, and Jesus came and stopped it. Everything there was normal. What Jesus did was abnormal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, to, yeah, to stop the wind and the waves. I believe all the storms and things is the ultra alt- crop is the fall of man and the fall of nature. Yeah. With man. Okay. And in a broader sense of argument. In the bro- yeah, in and that sense. There was the flood that ruined the entire world. Okay, and that was... That was a weather phenomena. Yeah, the worldwide flood. Um, so th- this is interesting because this, I-, I do believe this isn't just a symbolic section. I think this was a warning sign to God's people, you know, because uh, when you don't have water, folks, you don't, let, you don't live long. And, uh, and, and I believe this was a literal thing. It was a warning sign, so it dropped. It, it's interesting as we look at this because the, the Old Testament in the Pentateuch spoke of blessings for obedience to God and curses for disobedience. And among the curses for disobedience, I perhaps left you text in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 11 and 28. Are those on your notes under Roman numeral one? Those are the ones that says, you know what? God will withdraw the rain so that your crops die when you are a disobedient people. So the the Jewish people fully understood that every weather issue was linked to their closeness to God or lack thereof, right? Now, I like Job because, you know, God questions Job. Have you seen my storehouses of snow? And on a day like today, I mean, it makes me marvel, you know, that God chooses where the snow falls and in how much. Because he, he took his giant scoop, you know, and took his out of the store. I just love that word picture in Job. Those are, those are his weapons storehouses. It is arsenals. Arsenals. And have you seen my, my storehouses of hail? Hail. Which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war. Excellent. Yeah. Lightning. Uh, you know, thunder. I mean, all of those things, you know, and, and Jesus and the, I thought you might have been going over there. Uh, Jesus says, you know, you, you, um, you, you read the, the sky, you know, sail, sailor's delight, red sky, whatever, all that business, right? But you don't know how to read the signs of the times. <laughs> so that's where I, I tend to think this section reminds us, you know, God's in, in charge of weather. So just a couple of comments. It's interesting that I'm not sure any English translation translates drought as plural, but the Hebrew is plural. Verse one, concerning the droughts, plural. New King James, New King James has plural. Great. It, it's plural. So it wasn't just one, but a series. And that reminded me, the single S on there reminded me of the time of Elijah and uh, the prophets of Baal and Ahab, because there was a series, I think, of three years of drought that there was no rain upon the land until God gave the word to, to Elijah. Right. And this was the whole uh, issue of the woman, you know, and her son. We have a little flour. We got a little oil. We're going to eat it and die because th- see th- this was God's message to, to Ahab was a wicked king. You understand that? So it droughts. This was a series of droughts. And his people are going to mourn, verse 2, because of death. The mourning is because of death. Verse 3, it will affect all classes of society, this drought. So even the rich, you can store some water away, folks, you know, in your cistern. But even the the rich or the nobles are going to be affected. Verse 4, all agriculture will be affected. Verses 5 and 6, even wild animals, you see. So here's a picture of totality. That's why this section of the prophecy of Jeremiah is pointing to apocalyptic messages where it's not just God's judgment anymore on his people, Judah. There's the, you know, the mountaintop peaks, you know, the layer upon layer. And we're going to start to see, you know, language that goes, God must be speaking of a greater and wider judgment, which we're going to see, you know, in Armageddon. Uh, even in the Old Testament and beyond, as we look at this prophet, okay? Let's please read uh, in part two in your outline. We'll break this up now. We're going to look at the series of three sets of prayers, and that's what we end up with tonight. Jeremiah prays three times to God because of the severity of the ruined undergarment, the severity of the smashed jar, 
the severity of drought, which means everybody's going to die. See, these are all judgment pictures. He prays and intercedes and God answers three times. So that's what we're going to uh, finish with tonight. So first letter A under Roman two, the first intercession. We're going to read verses seven through nine, please. Seven, eight, and nine. Though our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. O you, hope of Israel, its Savior in the t- in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? Why should you be like a man confused? like a mighty warrior who cannot save. Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. I I bet every one of us have prayed that kind of a prayer. Oh, God, please don't leave me. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. (laughs) Right? This is a personal entrance into the prayer life of Jeremiah in this section, in this chapter. So, Uh, Those of you might want to review this at at another time. It's just very emotional and very, very personal. What words or phrases stood out for you in his prayer? There's just powerful language in it. Anything stand out for you? I'll let you. Hope. Oh, God, the hope of Israel. You're my hope. This is all I've got, God. You're it. If, if, If this doesn't work with you, I do fail. There is no other hope, right? That's precious. What else? Is there any other words or phrases that do uh, you, have you prayed that way to God sometimes? God, this, this is so desperate. Please do something for your namesake. Your reputation is on the line, God. Right? I mean, there's a, there's a, do you, are, are you filled with enough faith to demand that God does something? This is in the Holy Text, and we don't find per se that God shuts him down saying, that was an inappropriate prayer. You should not approach me that way. Now, the answer to the prayer is, though, that God isn't going to change his mind on the judgment, but he doesn't rebuke Jeremiah for being bold enough to say, God, I'm going to, like, I'm going to grab the horns of the altar, and I'm not going to let go unless you bless me, uh, Jacob, wrestling with God. I'm not going to let you go. It, it That's risky faith, isn't it? Well, just like Moses approaching God, don't destroy the people, don't destroy me. In that case, God changed. In this case, God is not going to change. That comes in, in the close of the chapter tonight, or in, in the, the, the last answer to prayer in verse 15. God says, even if Moses prayed for you, I wouldn't change my mind. But thank you for raising that because that's powerful. He did. When God's people pray fervently to him, I mean, in the will of God, there's times, yes, he answers that prayer. And there's other times where he says no. But this is a precious section of verses. So just glance at it with me uh, real, real quickly here. You are in our midst. I mean, yes, God, you're here. We're claiming you and your presence uh, with us here. So first, I, I see, first of all, this really is a vicarious confession the curious meaning Jeremiah is praying for the people in verse um, seven, right? Notice the first person pronouns in verse seven, the lumpy. He is praying not just for himself. He's praying for the nation. That's what I mean by the curious, right? Our sins against us. He includes himself with the people, right? Against us, our backsliding verse seven. We have sinned, verse 7, you see? He, he's identifying himself with, his, with the people. And, and of course, you, you kind of see Christ in that picture who vicariously, right, goes to the cross for our sakes, uh, where Jeremiah prays that way. Number two on my outline, the endurance of faith. The endurance, Jeremiah shows me that, right? He claims God as Israel's hope. And, and the, the title or that name of God is used then uh, three times in this chapter, also in verses 19 and 22. That's a precious name for God. You are our hope. It's a name. It's actually a Hebrew name. 
Oh, hope of Israel. And then God as Savior. Who of us doesn't know God as a Savior in a time of distress? God, in his mercy, has answered prayer for all of us immediately at certain occasions or times. God, who is the Savior. But then there are the questions of faith. Number three, the questions of faith. God, you're like a stranger. I mean, you're, you're the God of my hope. You're the Savior God. But you're like a stranger at other times where, where you're like a one-night traveler. You stopped in the Mount Morris Motel, but you moved on the next day. That's a prayer of faith. God, I don't understand always that this, this subjectiveness of the nearness of God in a believer's life. And then all of a sudden, there's the absence of God. Where are you? Jo- Job, that's the crisis of Job, the whole book. I know you're with me. I know you're God. And then, you know, then there's another day of crisis. And where are you? That, to me, is is a question of faith, right? And then the next one, though, is even interesting. Verse (laughs) 9. Why are you like a man taken by surprise or a warrior powerless to save? Friends, that that one is is by faith because he he is is praising God for his infinite power. You're a warrior. I know you can do something immediately in this moment. But the very next word is, your, pl- your power isn't being applied to me right now. You're powerful, but your power isn't working in me. Th- that's, a, that's a prayer of faith. Why are you like that sometimes, God? Right? You answered prayers of deliverance for some of our church family. You did not answer prayers for deliverance in this life for others in our church family. You're like a warrior who's, who can't do anything. Whoa. That's a powerful expression, right? And low, then low batting, low, low batting score. Okay. And then I said, number four, there's a confession and a cry of faith, a confession. God, you are among us. Your divine presence is with us. And there's a divine connection. We bear your name, this closeness again. And then there's this personal plea or this cry of faith. Oh, God, please don't leave us. Please don't leave us. Don't forsake us. It's all vicarious. He's praying this for the nation. Let's find out God's response. Please, we're reading verses 10, 11, and 12. Three verses. Thus says the Lord concerning this people. They have loved to wander thus. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, The Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. The Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Thanks. Yeah, that's where we stop at that section. What's God's answer to Jeremiah's fervent prayer? Can you summarize it from these verses? In fact, God's, this is the third of three times in the book, God actually tells Jeremiah, don't bother praying. This is the third of three times. I put that in your notes. You don't find that anywhere else in scripture where God says, don't bother praying. In this historical context, bear in mind, with this generation of people uh, in there. So this is, this is God's response. This is his answer to being the God who's with us, the God who is Savior, the God who is our hope. He says, nope, not for these people. Not for these people. Which teaches us something else about God. What does it teach us? What does this teach us about God? Yes. Yes. And, 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 you know, there, there is, I mean, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but his patience comes to an end. His grace, that's why Hebrews, right, um, to, to, 
today, if you hear his voice, don't turn from him because you may not hear his voice tomorrow. Right? So the justice of God, the holiness of God, and that his, his patience has a limit. And for this people in this historical context, it's over. It's over. So he, he will consume them, or I heard in your translation, or the NIV uses the word, I'm going to destroy you with the triad of my weapons, sword, famine, and plague, right? Now, the famine is because of the drought. You understand the connection, you know, in the text there. But this section it is, is God's answer because the case God has against them, they love to wander, verse 10. They have no self-restraint, none. Uh, for the sin that they're doing. Number two, he will not accept them in verse uh, 10, right? They're wic- uh, th- th- this is a frightening phrase, but this is where we- it points us ahead to the new covenant, by the way, in verse 10, right? He will remember their wickedness. He will remember it, which means, folks, the divine judge doesn't let anyone off for anything. But see, this is going to point us ahead to the new covenant where the exact opposite phrase is used. And that's what I used in my, my sermon last, this last Sunday, right? The new covenant says God will do what regarding our wickedness. He, he, he will, he will not remember it. He will drown it. Right. But here in this context of this people, th- that uh, blessing isn't coming to them because their their time for turning and repenting. Um, has passed. So verse 11, don't pray because it won't work. Uh, Verse 12, all of your religious ceremonies and, and actions, they won't help either. Verse 12, right? So don't bother with that because uh, Hebrews 11, six, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you don't have faith in approaching God with a religious action or work, it's a useless work. It's useless. And then there's the triad of judgments. Now, we have a second prayer of intercession. It's a singular verse, verse 13. The second prayer of Jeremiah, verse 13. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you a sure peace in this place. Now, that yes, that's just it, a second intersection. It's as if Jeremiah is pleading that perhaps the fault doesn't lie with the people. The fault lies with whom? So why not just judge them? Judge the false prophets who are speaking falsely, verse 13, right? They're the ones who are speaking wrongly. So it's as if... Jeremiah is pleading, God, just judge them, not your whole people. Let's now read God's second response, verses 14 to 18. 14 to 18. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I will, I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak to them, command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the, de- and the deceit of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who, and who say, sword and famine shall not come upon this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast in the streets of Jerusalem, victims of famine and sword, with none to bury them, them, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. For I will pour out their evil upon them. Uh, Next verse. 17 and 18 yet, yes. You You shall say to them this word, let my eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. If I go out into the field, behold, those pierced by the sword. And if I enter the city, behold, the diseases of famine. 
for both prophet and priest ply their trade through the land and have no knowledge. Thanks. That's where we'll pause. Here's God's answer to that brief little second prayer. God, maybe the fault is just with the spiritual leaders. You should just judge them and, you know, spare everybody else. What's the answer that he hears from God? Yeah. (laughs) So in verses 14 and 15, God confirms, yes, the prophets are at fault. They are not speaking my word. Then you get down to verse 16 and you see God goes after the people because this is where, folks, we've got to remind ourselves with spiritual discernment, uh, be careful of what you're listening to and who's preaching and the message you're receiving. Because you're responsible as a people for the message you hear and take to heart, right? We are all teachers are judged doubly. We get that. But people are responsible to discern, you know, true and false messages and, of course, to take the right word to themselves. So in verse 16, the judgment is going to fall upon the people as much as the prophets they're going to be thrown out into the streets and, and suffer, you know, judgment as well, too. And then look at 18, just briefly. There's this triad of, of couplets, that, which shows this universal picture of judgment. This is where it starts to, to look like there's a judgment on a judgment here. Verse 18, um, that Jeremiah can go into the country, line one, this is poetry, and then you look at line three, and he's going in what location? Line three. Country and city show this, this picture of a wide, you know, universal picture of where judgment is going to occur. And the judgment will occur in line two via the sword and in line four via the famine. So we see this second couplet of judgments in there. And then in line five, there's another pair and it's prophet and priest. So th- when, when these words in poetry kind of get lumped together, we, I call this a triad anyway of these couplets, this kind of shows this picture of a universal judgment that's going to come. And we'll see it more clearly in other texts. This one is just one of the earliest ones here. The end result, they're going to go to a land that they don't know. They're going to go to a, you know, Babylon that they know nothing about. And, and um, it's not where there should be. So we, we're going to close now with the third intercession of Jeremiah. We're reading the last verses of chapter 14, starting at verse 19. Read to the end of the chapter, please. Verse 19. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Does your soul loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but behold, terror. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, and the iniquity of our fathers. For we have sinned against, against you. Do not spurn us. For your name's sake, do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember, and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? We have set our hope on you, for you do all these things. Thanks. And that closing verse, you know, setting your hope on God, again, it's a very uh, warm entrance into the prayer life, you know, of Jeremiah, the personalness of it. And I just ask this question as we get started to close this text tonight. How should God's people deal with our expectations of God that don't come about? How, how do you deal with that? Matthew eleven six. Matthew eleven six and okay yeah so there is a blessing you know what there's more mystery to god than any of us ever wants to admit um in the closeness of god in the closeness of jesus in the preciousness you know of that i i i think perhaps you know um there's there's just way too much more of god than we're ever going to (laughs) get and maybe that's that's You know, I mean, to admit that there's sometimes you're just not going to understand what he's doing 
what he's doing next or what he's going to do <laughs> beyond that. Um, the, the mystery of it. And this section of this text just makes me think that way, right? The immensity of God and his ways are higher than ours uh, and his thoughts are higher than ours. There's just some things in this life um, I'd love to, I'd love to understand it, but I, I'm just not going to get that. So I, I like that by faith, Jeremiah asks some hard questions, please. Verse 19. I hope you ask the same in faith, right? Don't fall away on account of God. I don't get you, God. I'm going to chuck you. I'm done with you, right? No, in faith, go to God, right? Have you rejected us completely? There, there is some sense of despair in Jeremiah, do you think? See, he's gotten two rejections from God, two prayers. God's answered, nope, I'm not changing my mind on this. I'm going to smash the clay jar and I'm going to disperse the people, right? Have you, the second question, God, do you despise your people? Oh, that's filled with emotion, isn't it? And weeping. Do you despise us? Right? Third, why have you afflicted us so that we can't be healed? <laughs> Maybe that's the prayer that a, a believer who gets cancer prays. Pancreatic, it's never going to be cured. You know, some of you have had those kinds of health crises, right? And gotten to that point, you know, in, in going to God, you know, with this. And here's where this, sometimes there are broken expectations that we just have to deal with. Verse 19, we hoped for peace, but we didn't get it, right? We expected God to act one way. And he didn't, right? Nothing good has come. <laughs> and we, we expected a time of healing, and there was only terror. He's still God. He's still on his throne. You don't find Jeremiah walking away from the, from the assignment at this point, do you? But he asked the hard questions, and you know he's hoping for something, and it doesn't come about. So here's another vicarious confession, verse 20. It's precious. Lord... We, look at the first person plural pronouns again. We acknowledge our wickedness. Jeremiah puts himself in with the people, you know, with the crowd of people. The guilt of our fathers. We have sinned against you. <clears throat> That's what we call a vicarious confession, where you are confessing for other people. <clears throat> Sorry. In verse 21, the honor of God is at stake. He believes if God really smashes his people, <coughs> God's honor is at stake. And, and he wants God to remember his covenant with them. Verse 21, which covenant does God want? Uh, does Jeremiah want God to remember? I always wish they'd be identified every time the word covenant comes. But which covenant does God, does Jeremiah want God to remember? Yeah, which one is that? Okay, it's not the Mosaic Covenant, because the Mosaic Covenant is, is bilateral. I'll do you know my part, you do your part. Abrahamic, I'm, I'm confident this is speaking of the Abrahamic Covenant, where God promises, I will be your God, you will be my people. I'm God cuts, you know, the animal is cut in half. Abraham, Abraham is asleep. God walks through it because he's the one uh, who will fulfill the whole covenant for him. God, remember your covenant, your Abrahamic covenant. I think that's, that's a precious remembrance here at this point. And then uh, the answer to the drought, the answer is interesting. Verse 22, where does rain come from? Verse 22, does it come from idols? No, look at the second question, because I think this is interesting to my to my question of is is weather just a pattern or is it by design? Look at the second question of verse 22. Do the skies send down showers all on their own? The answer is no, no, friends. The rain falls specifically and exactly where God wants it and the amount he wants it. Uh, is the is is what this text is saying right here, which I think is just fascinating, isn't it? God is the answer to the drought, which was the beginning of the chapter. The skies just don't rain by themselves. 
So here's a confession of faith, verse 22. Our hope is in you. Our hope is in you. You're the one who does all this. God, I mean, I've got nothing else in my, in my basket, God. It's you and you alone. That's all I've got. And that's where I'm going to stick. Okay. So now we close just ever so briefly. We read the first four verses of chapter 15 because it's the answer. It's God's answer to the third prayer of Jeremiah. So we're reading 15, one through four, and that's where we'll end for tonight. 15, one through four. Then the Lord said to me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight and let them go. And when they ask you, where shall we go? You say to them, thus says the Lord. Those who are for those who are for pestilence to pestilence, and those who are for the sword to the sword, those who are for famine to famine, and those who are for captivity to captivity. I will appoint over them four kinds of destroyers, declares the Lord: the sword to kill, the dogs to tear and the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. And I will make them a horror to, to all the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. Great. And that's the answer to the third prayer. God, you are our hope. And God says, even if, if great intercessors stood before me. Now, Moses, it was mentioned earlier uh, at the golden calf incident, God wanted to destroy the entire nation right there and then. And Moses prayed and interceded, and God changed his plan. He changed his plan. Samuel, I gave you a couple of texts where he interceded for the nations when the Philistines were coming to annihilate all of Israel. And in Samuel's farewell message to the nation, he interceded for the nation because God was holding against them the fact that they asked for an earthly king. And God wanted to destroy the whole nation because of that. They, they had rejected God as king. They wanted an earthly king. Samuel interceded and the nation was spared. So there's your reference. God says, even if those two guys come up, I'm not going to save this people. Right. This is the, the historical generation of, of this people. God has a determined will. He has a determined will. Send them away from my presence. That's verse one. Right. Let them go. Send them away. Let them go. The time of grace is over. Uh, the opportunity to turn uh, has passed. So send them away. And there is an individually determined destination. See, So even. Even hell, we say, has layers or levels like heaven does. It's not just one lump judgment. Some, you know, t- uh, will, will die by death, sword, starvation, and some by captivity. There's an individually determined judgment. And it's interesting. You see, this text then takes you into Revelation 13, verse 10, where the same verse appears. Those destined for the sword will die by it. Those destined to starvation will die by it. Those by captivity and the, um, the Antichrist. This is taken into Revelation 13. That's why we start to see this, this shift of a local judgment on the people of Judah in the seventh, sixth century BC to a global judgment that will happen at the end times. Um, and this is one of those verses that points to that. And then the destroyers that are mentioned. Okay. <laughs> Well, just some last things, right? God bids us to respond truthfully to him now. Today is the day of salvation, right? As we're closing, sin's damage is worse than I think. When I look at these two chapters, its damage is worse than I think. Um, And that's why I need Jesus. I just picked Colossians 1 verse 27 tonight for myself because it talks about Christ in you the hope of glory. And I picked up on that verse in particular because of the word hope. Christ is any person's and any nation's hope. Christ is. And we've, we've still got to be in the business of proclaiming him well in this new year. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for 
taking us through some very hard texts here in these chapters tonight at the beginning of this new year. And Lord, uh, we grieve for our own nation. We pray vicariously even now, God, for our own nation. That is not much different than your Old Testament people, Judah. Our nation has at large turned away from all that is in Christ, all that is godly, and turned to embrace all that is wicked and sinful. God, we ask for your moving grace. We ask for your forgiveness for our land and for our people. We pray, God, that you strategically position us to be proclaimers of your good news, because it's your gospel that calls people from darkness to light. And so, Lord, we know that there's still grace. There's still time. Your patience is long-suffering. It's lasting longer. But we also sense, Lord, even turning to 2022, that the return of your son Christ is imminent. It's sooner. Um, The wickedness of this world cannot exist much longer without you, God, saying it's over. Um, So, Lord, please uh, build us up in the most holy faith. Uh, Help us, God, to draw personally ever closer to you as uh, the peril is ever closer to us. And, God, may we be your shining lights uh, on a hill wherever you place us, that uh, people would be called from darkness into the light of Jesus Christ, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. 